May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on InterTalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz and marketing talk. I am Scott, your host, and a joker, a smoker, and a midnight toker. I sure don't want to hurt no one, as they say. And speaking of tokers, uh, somewhere out, out with us in virtual producing land is Paul B. He's um, he's over 21. He's always producing responsibly, so they say. So uh, I say I say you go, Paul. You know nobody's going to judge you. And I think you know I, I think it's it's good for you to get out there and just admit that you have a problem. I think that's the first step. So good 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 for you. Uh, so who am I? Uh, what do I do? And how do you reach me? Uh, I run a marketing and PR consultancy uh, for mostly tech startup companies uh, now out of Phoenix, Arizona. It used to be out of Orange County, California, but I left. And I am also a um, uh, certified story brand guide. So I um, create better brand stories, uh, better website wireframes. Really the core of marketing kind of starts with the story and starts with the uh, the message. So I like to help folks and particularly a lot of my startup clients need that kind of help. But you know, perhaps the hardest and most critical part of running any business is getting marketing right. I, so many entrepreneurs just struggle with it. And you can either keep spending money on marketing without the confidence it's being spent on the right things, or you can pinpoint exactly what needs to change. The Story Brand Marketing Report is a brand new online assessment that lets any small business owner understand where their marketing plan is falling short, what it should look like. If you feel like you've been marketing your business without a playbook or you're a marketer out there and you're like, I, I really need to have, have a, a better understanding of all the, how this, all this stuff fits together. You will love the, your custom marketing report. So take the free assessment. Just send me an email at scott at robertson.com, two M's like communications.com. I'll be happy to send you the link. You will love it. You guys tuned into a great episode of the show. I'm excited because I'm, uh, I'm excited to welcome to the show uh, a rare representative of the actual news media, believe it or not. Uh, this guy's reviewed bazillions of tech products and services for, th for publications like Newsweek, uh, Club Life Magazine, Gear Patrol, Maxim, uh, Fodor's Travel, Discovery News, so many others over such a long career. Uh, he's also an author, a podcaster himself with a podcast called The Family CTO. He's a, uh, a speaker doing keynotes. Um, he's especially drawn to uh, devices dedicated to travel, audio, and power, but considers himself a tech generalist. He's always excited to share information about cool, practical gadgets and non-tech stuff with anyone who's going to listen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, award-winning technology journalist, Scott Tharler. Thanks for hey, coming, Scott. Thanks for having me. I appreciate this. And it's, it's great for your audience because they get two Scots for the price of one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They're, they're like, which, which Scott are we talking to now? It's, it's going to be great. So Scott, you know, you, um, I, I talked a little bit about your, your career there, you know, maybe just tell the audience a little bit, how did you get to where you are now? Wow. Um, well, first, thanks for the great intro. Uh, how I got to where I am now is sort of a hodgepodge. Uh, I started off working for IDG newsletters. Um, this is back when things like Lotus 123 and Lotus Notes were actual software that people talked about. Uh, so way back in the 90s. And I did I did PR for I did PR for IBM for Lotus Notes. I'm I'm there, I'm there with you, man. I'm right oh, there wow. with you. Maybe we crossed, maybe we were at Lotus Sphere in Orlando at some point together. Yeah, um, maybe so. Yeah. So I, I basically started my career my professional career there and that working with those people it was owned by pc world and they started doing tips of the day and i thought oh i could write a tip of the day and i looked at like what could i write about and it wound up being microsoft outlook which had just come out again dating myself uh, and in writing about microsoft outlook uh i don't want to yada yada over the the great parts, but it basically everything led to something else. Writing the tip of the day led to a different tip of the day. And then that led to articles that read, led to uh, writing books. Uh, the books that I wrote are actually not about technology. They were about mostly gambling and poker. Um, mm. And I think there's some very interesting, as I was thinking about poker and marketing, I think there's some very interesting crossovers there. Um, and there is, you know, there's that book, The Poker MBA, but 
uh, in general, I think poker is interesting because when you're first learning, you have to think about what are your cards? Level two is you think about what are your opponent's cards? And level three is you think about what do you think your opponent thinks your cards are? And I think there's some interesting things in marketing where like, if you're just looking at what your message is and what you want to say, that's looking at your cards when really you want to be at level three where you're thinking about how do they perceive what you're putting out there that they want to hear about. So, um, so true. It's, it's getting, it's getting a little far into the marketing ways there, but, um, essentially everything I did sort of put me on a path of writing more articles and I always managed to sneak in, even for the poker magazines, I was writing about tech because it was kind of a lifestyle thing because poker guys love tech and headphones and all that stuff. Sure. Um, and then I wound up writing for a lot of those sites that you mentioned. And along the way, I have reviewed pretty much everything. Uh, so I definitely know a little about a lot. And I, I do tend to lean towards audio stuff because I think it's something that everybody's into and uh, power stuff as well, because everybody needs to charge their gadgets. But other than that, there's pretty much, you know, I've been to all but two, uh, two consumer electronic shows in the last 25 years. So I've, I've seen a bunch of stuff. I think you and I were one of the, some of the only people that, that braved this last one. I was, you know, I was there and it was a, uh, a bunch of a lot a lot of empty booths it was kind of it was kind of wild for you know if I had I'd never seen it so you know it wasn't it wasn't empty but it, but uh, certainly not uh, not not well trafficked this year I didn't think yeah when you're walking through the LG booth and you're used to seeing like dozens of huge OLEDs and instead you see empty space with a QR code that says here's here's a video of our former booths like it's kind of a slap in the face and it, it feels really weird, especially because this is happening in Las Vegas. So there's this weird, like, you know, we're in the yeah. middle of nowhere in the desert. And then there's like a ghost town in the huge LG booth or the Sony booth. But I, you know, I found there was a lot missing and we could talk yeah. all day about what was missing. And unfortunately I didn't get to hear a lot of the headphones and other stuff that I love to, to be able to do in person. But the stuff I was able to do is great. It was a lot more digestible show. And I really, I had a great show. Fantastic. Well, cool. So, so you're a journalist. Uh, you know, journalism in general <clears throat> isn't doing so well these days. So <clears throat> more than two, th about two thirds of the jobs have been eliminated. Uh, and really, they're, it's just, um, you know, I'm a journalism major from University of Missouri, Columbia School of Journalism. So I, I love journalism. I love journalists. You know, <clears throat> me doing PR is, uh, you, know, you know, I love working with journalists. It keeps me close to kind of my, my roots. But, you know, you've made it, you know, through your career, but you've had to get creative about it, certainly. And, and a lot of journalists, you know, your age, you know, that have been, you know, through it all, you know, certainly have a lot of different revenue streams and that kind of thing. But, you know, how, how have you, uh, how have you been able to stay relevant? Um, relevant, I guess it's just trying to keep up with the times, you know, like nobody can keep up with everything everywhere. Uh, I might know a little bit about robotics and a little bit about what's new in STEM toys and a little bit about VR. I don't know everything about everything, but it's uh, it's sort of a self-promulgating thing where because I've covered a lot of stuff for a lot of time, I have a lot of contacts who keep me up on what I need to know. And so, you know, if Acer or Sony or somebody is having a press conference, then I tend to know about it. And I also tend to hear from smaller folks because of my PR connections like yourself who who let me know about like, here's what's going on with this company that I might not have otherwise heard about. So um, I think that's, that's how I try to keep my content relevant and then keeping myself relevant. I guess it's just, like I said, staying up on, on what's out there. And I, I don't mean that I, uh, I'm trolling the, the TikTok streams out there, but it, you know, I have different sources that I go to when I wanna know about something. When, I, when I'm interested in high-end audio, I have channels that I go to, or when I'm interested in uh, home automation, then I have my places that I go to. 
And I think it's important for people to have places that they can rely on. Absolutely. Uh, and you are, uh, you're in Hawaii? You live in Hawaii? I do now. Uh, nice. And it's funny, in a, in a few Which weeks, island? I'm a, uh, the big island. Okay. Uh, my wife got a job here. She's a doctor and they need doctors here. So she, sure. um, she got this kind of dream job and we moved here about a year ago and we still go back to central New York to Albany and we're going back in just a few weeks so that the kids can like see friends and go to camp and stay somewhat grounded. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we've, yeah, we've been living here in Hawaii and it's, it's very interesting and it's, it's a very different thing. But my mind is right now, my mind is like, okay, what do I need to do with this house when I get back to Albany in a few weeks? And, and so I'm sort of thinking that way too. Interesting, man. That's got to be a flight. Albany to the Big Island. <clears throat> that's got to be a long one. That's yeah, definitely true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Hawaii is always, always uh, gorgeous, and to live there must be fantastic. But um, <clears throat> so, what do you look for in a story? You're always looking for stuff. Your content on LinkedIn is always super interesting. What do you What do you look for? Uh, mostly, it's is it practical? You know, it's. What's funny is that when I was writing for Maxim, it was so the opposite of what I normally write about. Um, what I tend to write about is more in that kind of gear patrol, like what's an everyday carry? What's something that will change how you do it? I actually, I was thinking about this recently. I would personally define gadget as something that is a helpful tool, probably has to do with technology, but doesn't have to, but it's something you could live without. Whereas gear is more of like essential, like you need gear, you need, if you're going camping, you need a tent, <laughs> you know, like you need some sort of shelter, you need something. So these are the things you actually need. Um, and I think gadget is that it, I could use it or I couldn't. I tend to like things that fall somewhere in the middle that are like practical, that change the way you think about how you're doing things. And it could be for home theater. It could be for, uh, I don't know, something that helps you to do what you want to do. It could be biking or stand up paddle boarding or international travel. You know, like if you don't know about certain satellite hotspots that exist or about ways mm -hmm. of tracking things that, so you don't lose stuff while you're traveling. There's, there's so much cool stuff to help you do what you want to do. So I think about what's practical. And I came up with the idea for the family CTO based on just thinking of my own stuff. Like, I, I don't want to just have a website that's all about like, here are the top phones, here are the top TVs, here are the top laptops. I want it to be more solution oriented. So I just naturally think, I naturally think in roundups and I naturally think in terms of what's practical, like what actually does something that helps you accomplish what you want to do. So Beautiful. anything that speaks to that really sort of uh, catches my attention. You know, in PR, <clears throat> we do reviews and reviews programs uh, <clears throat> really to build trust, right? It's the one thing you can't buy. You know, you can, you can buy a lot, of, a lot of things in marketing, but you can't buy trust. So PR comes alongside and said, well, what if we have great products and we get the media to plus one that? Do people trust your reviews? and? If, if and why is that? Um, it's hard to know. I, I don't know how much people trust my reviews, uh, but I do know that it's where that's where I look for my voice. I'm looking. I'm not just looking to play with some toy, and I'm not looking to just sort of write up some toy for the credit or the clips. I don't need the clips. Like I've I've been there and done that. I think yeah. I write from a place of, I want you to be able to trust what I'm saying. And so it has to be in a relatable voice. And I honestly think, you know, I kind of, I usually picture some friend or somebody that I know who needs this. And then I write as if I were writing to that person. Uh, it depends if I'm writing, cool. if I'm writing for a site, it kind of has to be in the, you know, the Forbes voice or the Newsweek voice or whatever, but Mm -hmm. that's usually the, the motivation behind it. Yeah. And you, and you work with a lot of PR people. You, you certainly have throughout your entire career. What's that relationship like, uh, you know, for, from, uh, you know, from a media perspective? 
and you know a lot about marketing too. So you kind of know, you know, both sides of, of what's going on, but, but uh, what's that like? Yeah, it's funny. You know, I grew up in the household. My dad was a direct marketer, like old school, like actually sent out mailers, like actual different packages and mailers and envelopes. And very cool. Um, he was always testing response rates and telling me like all these proverbs about how there's, there's uh, never time to do it right, but always time to do it twice. Like there are all these wise things that he would share with me. Yeah, um, yeah. So I kind of grew up as a marketer and found my way into journalism that way. So I think of myself as a marketer who happens to do journalism rather than the other way around. But um, I couldn't do what I do without PR people. Um, they, like I said, they helped me find things that I wouldn't have found. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what the issue is. I if If there are things, there's always things to improve. There are always things that like, you know, I've seen times where uh, a press release will misspell the name of the company. You know, that's off-putting, but yeah. I still responded. I still tested this thing and still wrote it up. And yeah. it's known now as one of the, um, you know, in the budget wireless earbud space, they're very well regarded. So it's a typo. Um, and I feel like I'm very, uh, I try to be very personable and sort of rise to whatever level of, you know, if someone's going to reach out and say like, Hey, how's Hawaii and what's going on? If they're actually asking and yeah. it's, it's like yeah. a person, not uh, just an automated uh, email. Right. Then right. I try to respond to that. And it's tough because there, there are things that I do respond. Uh, there are things I don't respond to that are from people that I know but I kind of think like, you know, they don't take it personally. If something really doesn't hit, then, you know, if something doesn't hit and it's something that looks like it's automatically generated, like a mass email, then I think, okay, it doesn't work this time. If somebody takes the time to actually write to me, then I say, okay, yeah, no, I do want to let you know, like, this is on target, maybe later. And, you know, there have been plenty of times where I think I was just writing something for Club Life magazine where... I was writing, I needed like one more thing and somebody came up with the perfect thing right at the right time. And when it works, it's, it's magic, but you know, yeah, I, I'm very proud of my relationship. I, I don't know the actual stats, but probably a fourth to a third of my 2000 plus people on LinkedIn or, or PR people. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, nice. but at least a fourth, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I just, I like to be able to work with people that I can count on who I know are, are very helpful. I always tell my clients, I say, uh, you know, you know, that, that uh, we as PR people, no matter what our seniority level is, <clears throat> we're kind of like overpaid editorial assistants. You know, we're, we're, we're gathering up the pieces and all the things. So that it makes the story easier for the journalist. And you can't have this like overinflated view of the job because the job, I said, isn't essentially ours. It's theirs. And we're trying to play in their job. And, and you know, and like you said, if if, um, if the the Venn diagrams sort of intersect between what we have and what a reporter needs, then <clears throat> it can be really great. You know, but I think, um, yeah, I, I approach it that way, too, I, I think. Uh, and I always kind of consider myself a, a massively overpaid editorial assistant, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny because so many things are so, uh, I have folks like who know me well enough to know that, uh, you know, they're pitching me outdoor gear. I happen to be in Hawaii for a little bit, you know, we'll probably be here for a while. And so they don't pitch me like the latest parka but they will pitch me something that has to do that I could actually use in Hawaii and test out in Hawaii. If somebody knows me that well, like I respond to that person. There are other people that, uh, I don't know. I'm trying, I, I don't want to, to out anybody, but there are people we'll just say who clearly it's either so automated or they just really don't understand what I'm writing about. You know, like, I'm writing about mostly tech with some gear and they're pitching me uh, whatever health and beauty or fashion or things that yeah. I just really don't tend to write about. 
women's handbags, things like that. Yeah. You know, you're like, In, well, unless it has a built in wireless charger, probably not going to write that one up. <laughs> you know, Jeff Graham used to always say, and he talked in Facebook a lot about uh, reporters that would get his first name wrong and get his gender wrong. And they would say, uh, Jessica, you here's a great story for you. And this kind of thing. And he's like, I've been doing this a long time. He goes, and he goes, and you know, I've been doing this a long time for USA Today. He goes, uh, he goes, without, you know, tooting my own horn, it's really not too hard to figure out that there's just the one Jeff and it's me and, 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 and that kind of thing. And like, you know, that can see, but he always kind of made, made fun of it, but he said he got, he got pitches all the time from people calling him every version of a J name that was a female. <laughs> and he always laughed about it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been called plenty of names, but never never anything in the J world. Um, I think there's there's yeah. also sort of a um, like a convention booth mentality when it comes to pitching, which is I'm walking down the aisle and I happen to know exactly where I'm going, and I don't really I don't spend as much time on the actual show floor as I used to, but when mm -hmm. I do, I'm going from point A to point B. I'm not just meandering around and you know flowing with the breeze. So. There are plenty of people who they're just they have much better eyes than I do, and they go, "Oh, hey, Scott, how are things in Honoka'a?" Uh, well, first of all, how's Hawaii? Or, "Hey, what's going on with Newsweek?" Or, "Hey," and they're just doing anything to try to pull you in. And I think there are pitches that are just like that—that that they just want to make some connection with you. They don't know me. Yeah. They want to connect with me. Just do anything, and I appreciate that. But when somebody says like, um, you know, like, hey, I'm wondering if you're going to write like another Maxim gift guide. Well, I haven't written for them for over five years. If you don't know that, <laughs> probably should have done your research first. Yeah, and and that's easy. That stuff's easy to find out. Well, cool. Um, so, you know, the paid aspect of the game is uh, all over the place these days. <clears throat> as a as a PR person, almost everybody that I'm dealing with, you know, <clears throat> we this paid aspect is there. How, how do you, um, I mean, you know, first of all, how do you, how do you deal with it? How does it, how does it intersect with you these days? You know, um, are there any kind of paid opportunities that you're involved with that sort of thing? And also, you know, how do you maintain your credibility on stuff like that? For me, the paid aspect, I try to keep it really clean. Um, I do what I call strategic reviews. Other people have called them private reviews, critical reviews. Essentially, it's that somebody shows me usually a product, but sometimes it's just their materials like a website yeah. or, or whatever. Um, but let's say it's a product. They show me a product and they say, okay, review this for us as if you were reviewing it for some outlet and really get in there and tell us what you like, what you don't like. What do we oh, say nice. that it does that it doesn't do? And these are things that I tend to do um, it's like two or three days worth of work. So 16 to 24 hours of work. Oh, sure. And if I yeah. can turn that around in a week or two and it's timed right, then it usually works very well for products that um, it either has unique features and or it's going into a crowded marketplace. Um, so this would be like, um, these. this is not a client, but I'm just thinking of a product that would be a typical thing that that seems like a fit. So AudioVox just came out with this thing at CES that they announced that is, it's a little speaker that's a decent size that has a clip that goes on your backpack. And when you open it up, there are earbuds inside. So it's a speaker, a, a little speaker and cool. earbuds. And so speakers is a huge category. Earbuds is huge. Even small speakers is huge but there aren't that many products. I've only seen a couple like, and I mean like a handful of products that combine a speaker with earbuds. So I would pitch them and say, hey, this seems like a good thing for you to know. Like, do you know that Fiaton has a, a earbuds like this? Did you know that Vissels has nice. a case like this? That's It's mostly coming from, it's a case that has a speaker built in, whereas this is a speaker that also has earbuds built in. And mm -hmm. here's perspective mm -hmm. on how to do that. So these, these strategic reviews that I do, it's really to give them perspective and be sort of the, the icing on the cake of R&D. It's something that's supposed to help them and help you, the PR people, 
to position the product and say, okay, the buttons don't work really great in this sense, but you really should be telling people that like the battery life is amazing on this, or here's something that you didn't, you never talked about that I discovered through using it. Um, so that's one thing that I do, but other than that, it's, it's a messy world out there. You know, I have very mixed feelings about using affiliate links because uh, yes, I would, I, if you knew me personally, you would know that I would, recommend this to you no matter what, whatever the product is. And so it makes sense like, hey, I recommended it. Why not get a piece of the action? Well, because if you don't know me, as most people out in the world don't, then it does sort of eat away at credibility for my, uh, in my perspective. I really, I, I don't know, you know, even some yeah. of the outlets I write for, they say, well, you know, we could include something that doesn't have an affiliate link, but naturally we prefer some that do because they're in business. <laughs> they actually have to make money. Exactly. And so true. I have to figure out as I'm launching this site, like what's going to be my way that I make money? Is it all just a front for speaking opportunities and other writing gigs? Or, yeah. you know, I don't want to have advertising on there and I don't want to have affiliates and then sponsors it seems better than affiliates in a way, because then you just, it's like I said, it's cleaner. You know that like the entire article has nothing to do with this, whatever, this VPN service or this other thing that's just helpful in general. Uh, if I'm reviewing earbuds and there's a, a VPN service out there, then you know that there's nothing funny going on. They're not influencing me at all to, um, to do that. You know I think disclosure is the key to that. So I would just say that, you know, um, I think, uh, and I always try to encourage, uh, you know, reviewers, I say, look, if, if, we, if we're going to send you a product, tell people that we, we sent it to you for free and we didn't ask for it back. But, you know, because we want you to keep using it, right? That, that, that's our plan. That's better than you sending back a used whatever, unless it's like a Taylor guitar and that's like, you know, five grand. You know, I mean, well, you know, it's like, we love you, but, come on, man. So, you, you know, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, there's, there's some things that are you know, really expensive that are, are hard to let people keep, you know, but um, I just, I think that the key to that is in disclosure. I, I think that, you know, if, if everybody is upfront about what's happening and, and you're saying, okay, you know, uh, you know, welcome to the family CTO, you know, and we have these sponsors and that kind of thing. And, and, and we're working with them because we believe in them. And they also help keep the, um, uh, uh, what do the trade press use the phrase, um, uh, su uh, supporting the publication, right? Yeah. And they'll use that phrase to say, uh, hey, you did, you got a, you got a great review in, um, <clears throat> you know, this magazine, we what are you planning to do on the ad side to support the publication? You know, and as long as that's disclosed and everything is cool like that, I think it's it's transparent and it's cool. Where you get into problems is what some of these like internet influencers are doing, and they're taking they're taking things and not letting people know. And then the FTC's all up everybody's butt, you know, because they, <clears throat> you know, they're breaking the rules and they're they're breaking the ethics and they're just shattering the um, the, the relationship. So, I mean, it sounds like you walk, you walk the line, you know, very, you know, very nicely and, it, and it's not a, a huge problem for you, but well, that's good. The problem is figuring out how do I actually make revenue and walk the line. It was, it's very easy to, to cross the line. It's very easy to say things. I'm, I'm very surprised when I hear, I've heard from, from PR colleagues who say, is it okay if, if you send it back? I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't it be? And they say, oh, well, it's just some reviewers refuse to send things back. Like they won't review it unless they can keep it. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, is that even, is that possible that a person thinks that that's ethical? Like, how, how is that happening? I've, I've um, run into that. And, and like I said, usually I, um, I always request, I say, would you please just say that? Would you please just in your, in your writing say, they send it to me for free and I'm keeping it. I like it. I'm going to hang on to it. You know, the, then you know, there's every, everybody is on the same page, yeah, right. And 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 people, will, and sometimes they'll come back and say, You really want me to say that? And I'm like, Yeah, I said, and the FTC really wants you to say that. I go, yeah. So let's just let's all just stay on the right side of the line. The, the reason that the FTC had to get involved in our business is because so many people 
want to want to do things that are unethical but i keep my brands above board by saying let's just disclose everything and and i'm and i'm always in there saying let's disclose this i would i'd like to see this put in here as a note you know whatever just so people know that we send it to you for free <clears throat> we're and and we want you to hang on to it absolutely that is absolutely the plan like yeah. i said unless it's like super expensive and then you know the client's going to say well we only have a few of these we're going to need to get that back you know, Taylor Guitars was very much like that. Yeah. And they were like, we just can't do it. I've, I've been very surprised. There have been times where I, I was just floored in both directions. There, there are times where somebody will say like, you know, 30 to $50 set of headphones. Okay, we want these back. And that's fine. You know, as long as uh, the disclosure goes both ways. Like I, I want somebody in PR to say like, okay, just so you know, we want it back. And I want to be really upfront about this relationship because Definitely. if it's if it's said the wrong way, then I say like, oh, okay, I definitely can't keep it then. Or I definitely don't even want it. If somebody says like, um, you know, we'll send you this if you review it or something like that. Like there's a way of phrasing it that it just gets messy. Icky. And, I, yeah. and, and so I say, okay, listen, I'd rather write it up without you sending it to me so that you know that these two things are mutually exclusive. Like, I don't want to get into that mess. And yet there are some times when there are folks like um, HP, when Star Wars The Force Awakens was coming out, this is how old my, my old laptop is, they sent me what I would say is a ridiculous review unit because they very clearly stated, uh, this is a gift we don't want this back. Uh, okay. They sent me a laptop inside of a wooden black briefcase with my name etched on it with other Star Wars, like a Darth Vader mouse pad, which that in and of itself is kind of a weird concept. But there's, <laughs> there's all this stuff. It was this huge package. It was super heavy. And I'm like, wow, I don't even remember who I was writing for at the time, but I thought, this is amazing. And so I, I was going... I was actually like a Mac guy and had just unfortunately uh, misplaced my laptop, which is another story. But I was like, <laughs> I guess I could go back to being a PC guy if it's this cool Star Wars PC. Um, but yeah, there's, there are times where people will send actual like laptops and expensive things and just never ask for it back or say, yeah, you can keep it. I'd rather have it be upfront, but there have been times where I've had to chase somebody down and say, hey, there's this $800 speaker can you please take it back or like, should I donate it? Like, what do you want me to do with this? Cause right. as, as much as it's fun to keep stuff, it's not fun to keep 80 things. I probably have easily, uh, depending on your definition of headphones, I probably easily have 80 sets of headphones and I haven't even counted them, but like at least 40 sets of wireless earbuds and then oh, like definitely. another 40 headphones and earphones and different things. And it is helpful to have a wide variety so that if somebody has, you know, a, a planar magnetic that's like under $500, then I can go, oh, I want to test it against these ones, but I still don't need 80 of them. So no. it's not, I don't know. I'd rather find some sort of uh, either recycle for charities or some way to donate it or recycle it. Or I have a couple of buddies who run like golf tournaments or poker tournaments where I can give them away as prizes. And that's Great way cool. To do it. Yeah. But then it's it's weird because I had a whole debate with friends and stuff about like if somebody sends me a review unit of something and I eventually discover that like a new one comes out or I just don't need that, is it okay to sell that? And I really wrestled yeah. with it because it's like, well, yeah. it's in my possession. I own it. And it would be unethical for me to say that I want to review something knowing that I want to sell it to someone else. So if I don't do that, then I think I could keep it clean. But it's it's hard to stay clean these days in terms of like influencers and paid mm -hmm. versus earned and, and all that stuff. Thus the, uh, the the five golden rules from our friends in Washington at the FT, at the FTC, you know, uh, bl uh, blogger, you know, and influencer rules about stuff like that. Disclosure, um, usually the key for that. Um, so have you ever taken on a product to review? I mean, you saw something and you said, man, I, just, I, I, I'm dying to play with that, that kind of thing. And, and you just said, 
I'm going to, I'm going to create an editorial opportunity around this because I just think it's so cool. Oh yeah. All the time. Um, yeah. Usually what happens the way the, the universe sort of comes together is that I'll find a couple of things. So I'll be at CES and I'll, I'll be walking along in through the robot pavilion and see these robots that have brushes on them. That's basically like a Roomba for your barbecue. And I'll go, nice. That's cool. I, it's not something I would do like a full review, but barbecue gadgets, let's do that. Or uh, yeah, yeah. just in the past week or so, like three different soundbar companies have come to me and they happen to be either Dolby Atmos or all in ones and something like, oh, what would be good? Uh, Dolby Atmos, because do people still, do people even know what that is? Or all in ones? Do sound bars need? Uh, a subwoofer and rears and other stuff, or are there actual competent sound bars out there that can do everything, play music and do home theater? So it's usually more of a like, yes, I want to play with this. And then what goes with this? Um, and it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle, which is what I like to do. That's very cool. Now, um, and you wrote a, an interesting blog, or interesting post. Your, your content on LinkedIn is great, by the way. I mean, I, I love the way I love the way you use the platform. So many people uh, aren't interesting at all on the platform. I mean, your stuff is always interesting. Even your comments on other tech journalists' reviews and stuff are interesting. So, I mean, I love that. But you wrote a post about, um, uh, a, 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 I mean, what, what did you call that? A, a thousand? I think it was death by a thousand emails. Death by a thousand emails. Yeah. Something so, like that. So, so tell me about that post because it's, it's, it's all about uh, traveling south on I-95. Well, yeah. what it what it came from was it came from the fact that even though I'm reviewing things, people will send me something and then all of a sudden I'll start to get emails as if I had purchased this and it will say, mm -hmm. congratulations, you just purchased this and congratulations, it's on its way and here's the tracking number and it's been delayed and now that you have it, uh, what do you think of it? And there's... It's, it feels like a thousand emails sometimes. And the, the cadence is just off. Like the, the frequency, the number, mm -hmm. the quantity. It reminded me of driving to Florida. And when you go down the interstate, I-95, there's this thing called South of the Border. And it's essentially this huge souvenir mecca. It's the kind of place <laughs> that would be in like Roadside America where oh, yes. you used to be able to, I think they had like a... a a golf of Mexico, like a mini golf place. I, I, I don't even know if that's still around, but, nice. but you would go there basically if you needed a restroom, maybe a quick snack, and then to just get back on the road. And there were uh, just millions of souvenirs. So to get people to stop for 50 miles in either direction, either coming from South, it's just in South Carolina. So that's why they call it South of the border, South of the Carolina border. Um, for 50 miles coming north or coming south, as you are approaching south of the border, every mile they have a different uh, billboard. And it will mm -hmm. just, it'll be like one long string that says, quit your belly aching, they'll pull over, or just keep yelling, or hey, uh, Paco says you should really stop at this place. There are a lot of plays on words, and it's sort of, it's amusing, but it's like every mile. And so there's something sort of fun and kitschy about it, but I think too many marketers look at that as a, a blueprint for, oh, this is what we should do. We should just come up with any excuse to, uh, oh, has it been a day? Has it been a, uh, you know, another mile in, in the world of marketing? Any yes. excuse to email instead of thinking, what is this journey like for this customer or Amen. potential customer? that we're either going to uh, we're going to piss them off or make them not a fan of the brand. I think that's what I, I wrote something like your, your marketing is doing the opposite of what you want. Like you're trying to build up your brand and keep your brand in front of people. But the way that you're doing it is putting your brand in front of people in an annoying way. Uh, and it's not easy. I, I think of when you walk into a store, Best Buy, what's the balance? You know, some people want immediate service and someone to walk up. 
some people are put off by someone walking up. Right. So if you're a salesperson in Best Buy, what do you do? You walk like 10 feet away and try to make eye contact? Like what's, <laughs> what's the good thing? And so the, the metaphor there is like, what's the right thing in marketing? Well, partially you really have to put yourself at the position of the, the customer. And this gets empathy. back to that, that poker thing. You have to have empathy. You have to, you have to want to take them on a journey, not take them for a ride, so to speak. So, oh, so true. Well, a amen to all that. And I, and, and I am on that side of the line as well. I, I think that um, the invention of marketing automation software has set the profession of marketing back decades, uh, you know, because the idea that we created software that makes it even easier for marketers to sort of load a shotgun full of crap and just, and, and it makes it so easy. It was pitched to me when I worked at NAM, uh, marketing automation software, they came in and said, oh, this member thing is great. You just so you just type in all your various emails and you can, you can email your members uh, once a day if you want to. And then my exact response back was, why in the hell would I want to do that? Yeah. And, and oh, oh, as long as, you know, as long as you, as fear as you want to. And then I was like, uh, and, and then I, and you know, people just don't understand an actual marketer understands, but a digital marketer probably wouldn't. The fact that, you know, marketing is a double-edged sword. It can cut through it can easily swing back and cut you, you know, and that's, and that's kind of what you're, what you're talking about. You're standing in line at CVS and they're trying to map every part of your customer journey, which always comes off as invasive and creepy. They send you a message and say, I notice you're in line at the, you know, at CVS, would you like this kind of coupon? And it's like, I would rather pay more and people not know where I was. It freaks me out. It creeps me out. It's wrong. It's evil. It's bad. Yeah. And, and I um, tend to, you know, I tend to have, if, if, if they send me a thing in line and, and I've had, the, I've been on speaking, um, you know, opportunities where I've talked on panels and I say, look, you know, if you begin your marketing with empathy and you say, what would you like? If you're in line and, you know, you, and you're a representative of every person and you feel like that that wouldn't creep you out, great. I said, but most people, if you said the sentence that we know you're standing in line at CVS right now, I'm thinking there's a camera pointed at me and I'm thinking there's some kind of geolocate thing. I'm sitting there one wondering how they're tracking me. And it just, it goes to our human aspect of, ooh, just yeah. friggin' ooh. You well, know? there's, there's, they're all tools, you know, the marketing automation thing, it's a tool. And I, I'm thinking back to a, an episode of the Simpsons where Homer gets this auto dialer and <laughs> it's the same basic thing. It's like, Hey, Homer Simpson here telling you to, and then like he bothers everybody in, uh, in town and they wind up busting his door down. It's like, <laughs> it's, right. it's not that far away. Like marketing automation email is not that far away from that. If in the wrong hands, if in the right hands and you actually are tracking customer journeys, and you're going like, okay, they here are people who didn't respond to this. Let's figure out, maybe we should email them less. Maybe we should, because the answer Love isn't it. always going to be more. You know, I was, as you're talking about being in line, I mean, that was location-based marketing was heralded as like the next coming of amazing marketing. And so this, this was going to be this thing where you're going to be walking by a Starbucks and get a coupon. And I thought like, wow, I, I don't think I want that, but no. is there a way that that could be valuable to somebody? And uh, I think, like you said before, empathy is the key. So don't yes. be big brother. Don't say, hey, we see you in line there with your cardigan and your this. Your, I would say something like, hey, we noticed that you've been in line for 20 minutes, which is creepy. But this is taking way too long. How about if we give you a free pastry or something like there, there okay. has to be a way of adding value and using the creepiness in a friendly way. That's yeah. not as creepy. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's still creepy. Like anytime somebody tells me something that, you know, we're, we're sort of used to targeted ads like, oh, I was yeah. looking for boots the other day. And now every ad happens to be boots we're sort of used to that, but there's still a creep factor. There's still Super a factor creepy. of like, I don't think I want anybody to know 
you know, it's one of the first things I do when I like I get a new phone or a camera or something is like take the location off. I don't want location associated with where I'm taking pictures. And I look at my kids' phones and make sure that their location is being used in the yes. right way. It's it's a it's a creepy thing that if used very sparingly, which most people don't, it, it can be used effectively, but it yeah. doesn't mean just because you can do it that you should do it. Uh, Jurassic Park logic in, in, in play. I love it. I love to see yeah. it. You know, um, it, it's so true. So, so many of my friends are privacy attorneys and, and it's created this like cottage, you know, bad marketing has created a whole cottage industry of the law. So they owe us like a sandwich or something because it's like, you know, bad, bad marketing and, and sort of irresponsible, unethical, I'm not thinking about the customer kind of marketing has created 14 of our lovely states in the United States of America to create their own privacy laws, which everyone has to adhere to. GDPR, of course, is uh, the, you know, the, you know, Europe's, you know, massive privacy protection uh, thing. California's, uh, you know, California Consumer Privacy Protection Act is all about that. And I always tell people, I say, you know, our profession is the problem. Our profession stepped too far, got too creepy, cut the goose open to see if they could get golden eggs out of its butt. And, 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 you know, and that's why you have all of these laws. And if your profession has to be regulated by the government, <clears throat> you've, you've already lost, you've, you've, al you've already, you know, done so many bad things that the, if the government's, if the government is not the hero of anything, anything in this story, but they have, there's so much public opinion that's boiled up on it, onto it, that they have to act. They have no choice but to act. And so they, so they have. So um, yeah, that part kills me. And I, and I, and I always try to tell folks, um, you know, uh, all of my clients, I say, you know, if we begin with empathy, we don't have to worry about privacy laws. Because we're light years ahead of where privacy law, privacy laws are taking care of the people that don't give a crap, and 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 they're gonna just gonna find them and, and you know and kind of play that game. But if we're using empathy and we're creating stuff that's great, every a great experience for people every single time, then um, we got a shot at building a relationship and doing what marketing is supposed to do. It's um you know it's a sticky area. It so is. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you uh, you know what do you think about you know, you've been in tech journalism a long time, you know, what's the future of tech journalism look like, do you think? Well, the pie is changing, essentially. And we've talked about influencers. Uh, you know, I think the days are gone of like, you know, the Walt Mossbergs and David Pogues is being the sole source of tech information to, to the millions of people. There are people like, I, I look at myself as a fairly typical consumer. Uh, I, you know, I tend to slant more towards techier things, but I get things, I find out about things on LinkedIn. I have several YouTube channels that I, I watch religiously. Um, and I also read articles and I'm reading on a phone sometimes and on a laptop sometimes. And so I think it's just, you have to assume that there's not one person anymore that uh, it's sort of like when your kids, <laughs> when your kids go from being like younger or, or tweens to actual teens, they're being influenced by a lot of things. It's not mommy and daddy anymore. There's not one source. There are lots of sources. And so I think uh, as scary as it is, I think we're about to enter adolescence in the world of tech journalism. And you have to know that, you know, I'm being influenced by YouTubers and by actual journalists and by people that I've later found out had uh, charged people to do reviews. And it's, it's a big world out there. I mean, a lot of people don't even realize that, uh, like how satellite media tours work when somebody yeah. happens to be on the Today Show or Good Morning America not necessarily all of the products will be like this, but there's usually at least one anchor brand that has paid thousands of dollars so that the person who's on there can say a specific something. You just yes. assume like, oh yeah, you know, this person just dropped by and just happens to be talking about tech for Easter or tech for spring or whatever. 
Well, yeah. they didn't. They didn't just drop by. It was very well planned. Thousands of dollars exchanged hands, and there's a, a specific message. So I think the lines of uh, advertising and editorial are going to be blurred, and the lines between journalism and influencer are going to be blurred. And I think people need to sort of make up their minds for themselves. And to some degree, I would say ignorance is bliss, but it depends on the consumer. You know, if you're just looking yeah. at this as entertainment, like, oh, I just like hearing about gadgets. That's one thing. If you actually are trying to buy a cappuccino maker or something, you need to know that, you know, whatever wire cutter says is actually a good one. And it's not that Nespresso paid them to say that. So true. So you, you're a guitar player. Uh, so what sort are your of. summer? <laughs> yeah. What are some of your favorite pieces of gear and why? What do you like? Um, what what makes you happy? I feel calling myself a guitar player is uh, <laughs> it's, it's like if somebody types an email calling them a marketer. Like I I, I know how to pick up the instrument. I know which hand to play with. Uh, you know, I had a, a roommate in college who had a guitar and a bass, and we would sort of just switch off. Like he would play one, and I would try to play the other. And so I learned just enough to be dangerous and sound sort of like I know what I'm doing, but. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, stuff I'm looking at now, uh, actually at CES, I saw a couple of pedals from Warm Audio. There was one that was called like the Foxy, uh, Foxy Tone Box, I think it's called. It was this like orange, velvety, very 60s and 70s kind of thing. Um, cool. That sounded pretty cool. I'd love to, I played it a little bit at the show. And they also had a phaser that I want to say was called like the Jet Phaser. And I haven't like, I'm not fancy enough. I have like a, a Fender Blues Junior and a Wah, a Vox Wah. Like that's the extent of my, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my setup. I, I don't have phasers and flangers and fuzzies and all this other stuff. Um, uh, one thing I'm actually looking forward to is uh, Positive Grid just came out with this Spark Mini amp. That, yeah, uh, I have a Spark. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, the, I have the, big, the big one. To say big, I mean, it's like a foot long, but I have the big one. Yeah, this little one, I don't even know. It's like, I don't know, eight inches, seven inches. It's, it's pretty small Remarkable. and it's, it's pretty cool in the way of like having a travel amp. So I'm kind of looking forward to playing that. The saddest part is we said before I'm in Hawaii. Well, my Stratocaster is in Albany. <laughs> so oh, there you so, go. You're separated. So, so right now I'm trying to figure out how, when I come back at the end of the summer, if I can, I, I'm going to look into like, if I can take it back on, on, on board and how much I have to pay, like, it would be worth paying 30 or 40 bucks just to be able to bring it back and be able to jam out and do totally. whatever. I, I love that form of expression because there's, there's something it's, it's sort of like with writing. It's like, there's something technical about it, but there's something artistic about it. You got to have a, a guitar in the Hawaii house. I mean, you, you, you got to, that's, that's, that's definitely yeah. true. Oh, are, we, you coming, we, are you coming back to go to have some, some four stringed instruments? We just, I don't have any six stringed instruments that, that are oh, like, actual, like regular size. So do you uh, do you play the uke too? You got to play the uke. No, I, my my kids started getting ukulele lessons, and we have three of them. We have three kids. They each have their own. And nice. I actually, I want to get them back into that because they were they're starting to. It's a very different yeah. sort of a uh, an instrument, but it's it's very fun. Like Steve Martin says about the banjo, you can't, uh, you know, you, you can't play a sad song on the ukulele, you know, <laughs> you know, you're, you're smiling and it just, it just sounds like I should be getting ready to have a Mai Tai. Yeah. Uh, so are, are you coming back for Nam? Are you coming to Nam show? In June? Uh, no, Anaheim? I'm not. I'm not coming back for that one. Um, there's an outdoor retailer show that I might go to in June. That's in Denver. It's uh, kind of depends on what happens with a, couple of job possibilities but uh i've got cool. a speaking gig in uh in the berkshires in, in western massachusetts that's going to be right. at this men's retreat that's like always a fun thing to, to show folks like here's what's going on and here's the latest thing so um yeah i haven't done too many shows i haven't really like in the old days there were like usually four or five shows a year that i would go to and yeah part of it is being in hawaii part of it is all the other stuff going on but um but I still, I try to keep up, but it's not the same. It's not the same as being in person. So, well, you know, they're going to move the NAM show. Uh, it, you know, it's always in January, and then the big, the summer show was always in July. They they have this. Um, uh, they they've moved it to June for like 
one show for the year kind of thing. And then I believe next year they're moving the big Nam show to April. So it's actually, oh, wow. so, okay. so April, it, so it won't be in that CES window, which always killed me by the way, because yeah. I always have, I have clients that will exhibit it both and man, oh, doing, those, <laughs> doing those shows back to back is a beast. Yeah. So I, I'm excited that they moved to April. I'm like, that's good. April works out. I, you know, CES will be long gone. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, nobody should spend more than 72 hours in Vegas. If you do, then you're just <laughs> for a shock. Agree. Well, um, I mean, this has been awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add? You want to tell us about the family CTO? Plug that a little bit? Um, sure. I mean, basically, right now it's a podcast. Uh, I'm not nice. sure why as a writer I chose to launch it as a podcast, but um, <laughs> I wound up podcasting about the podcast technology itself because I was, I was looking for it myself. Uh, like I said, we're just trying to have interesting discussions about the technology around the house, because in every house, there is somebody who it could be you, could be a spouse, could be a parent, could be a kid, whoever it is, is responsible for knowing and staying up on what's going on and how do I manage my digital life. Uh, yeah. So that's it's great. Those are the kinds of conversations we're, we're looking to have. And I've, I've basically broken things down into five different categories that include things like home office and automation or food and health tech or travel and outdoor tech, things that, again, very nice. solution-minded uh, things. Probably the best way of folks sort of looking out and seeing what I'm up to is actually to go to my link tree, which is linktr.ee slash the family CTO. That basically goes to a, a page that all it is is links to uh, articles and podcasts and uh, my LinkedIn profile, if you want to reach out to me that way. Um, nice. So that's pretty much a catch all for everything. Very cool, man. Well, great. So that's how people are going to contact you. Uh, well, what have we learned today, folks? We learned that the world of media reviews is still a very big deal uh, for tech and consumer companies. Brands need that trust. It's hard to buy it anywhere else. Uh, we know that Scott Tharler is going to be out there uh, bringing us the coolest new stuff with the family CTO and everything that he's doing and stuff that we're simply going to need to have for years to come. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show, Scott. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Oh, my pleasure. And that's it for me, folks. Uh, we will see you next time on May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media. Media.